Thank you so much to my very kind hosts at the Center for International Legal Studies at Jindal Global Law School for inviting me to contribute to this really amazing looking series. I wish I had more Wednesday nights free. I'd be here every time. Um, so uh, if I can do this, for those of you who don't know me, just try, there we go, wait, 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 there. Um, this is me. I think uh, you've just heard a very good overview of all of the many, many things I'm involved in at the moment. But um, just forgive me for today, I'm revisiting Rage for Order. So I hope not too many of you re have read it too closely. Um, I'm actually in the very final stages of submitting a, a book to Harvard University Press. It's due to go and copy editing any minute now, which is about something quite different, which is about peacekeeping in the British Empire in the age of revolutions, um, which actually has a chapter on Bengal in it, which I'm very nervous about, not having done any South Asian history before. So we'll see how that goes. You can tell me later. Um, but tonight I've been asked specifically to talk about the role that imperial practice played in the unfolding of 19th century interpolity law broadly in the vicinity of India. To do this, I will look at the vernacular articulation of two key legal concepts um, in the margins of the British Empire, protection and sovereignty. In doing so, obviously, I will be drawing explicitly on case studies I explored with Lauren Benton in the book we co-authored together in 2016. In that book, Laurie and I explored a project of frenetic legal reordering in and around the British Empire during and after the Napoleonic Wars. Inside Empire, the project of imperial legal reform was driven by the need to incorporate newly conquered territories with confessionally, racially and legally diverse populations. Dull bureaucrats, many of them deployed from the imperial center, wrote tomes of letters and reports diagnosing foreign legal systems and the worthiness of new subjects to enjoy civil and political rights. This process was also inflected with the cacophony of colonial voices. Scandals of empire rolled in unbidden from every corner of the globe. The empire also sought to collect and curate colonial voices by sending commissioners of inquiry almost everywhere between 1819 and 1838. And as we've mentioned already, I'm currently working with a team of scholars to explore that project. Another core strand of the book focused on how routines of imperial reordering spilled over imperial boundaries, restructuring into polity relationships. Um, <clears throat> the imperialism of international law is well known, of course. Anthony Yangi's work in particular invited us to find it deep in the heart of West Western intellectual history. We focus on less profound but equally consequential moments of interpolity ordering in practices as diverse as the extension of a very British iteration of prize law into slave trade policing through profligate appeal to legal discourses of protection and in contradictory efforts to conjure new regional orders to further imperial interests. We sought to show how imperial concerns inflected contingently, messily, but ubiquitously into international order in a formative moment in its history. Let me start by unpacking how the supremely imprecise legal category of protection shapeshifted in contests between Britain and the Kingdom of Kandy in Ceylon from 1795 to 1820. Protection is a very old legal category. It had been used at times to argue for the subordination of colonized peoples to European monarchs, to invoke the church's obligations to protect and control the abject from exploitation, to justify aggression against states who harmed subjects and protected peoples, and of course, to define a species of treaty relationships between dominant and subordinate states. Laurie and I argue that these many meanings blurred at the boundaries of early 19th century British imperial practice. Individual and corporate protection bled into an intra-imperial and interpolity relations in transformative ways. By the end of the 19th century, of course, protection had become little more than a prelude to intrusive and intimate colonialisms excused by international law. But that was not the whole story, that we, as we will show here. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> so back to Ceylon. When Britain took possession of Ceylon from the Dutch in 1795, it acquired control over only a tiny part of the island, a gallingly small part, as you can see from the map. British authority replaced Dutch rule and a ring around the island's perimeter. In the center of Ceylon and wet highlands region, the Kingdom of Kandy held tight control, policing movement across the porous border that admitted trade and allowed access for Kandians to the sea. Relationships between the center and the coast were unsettled. Like the Dutch before them, British governors regarded the Kingdom of Kandy as an obvious object of annexation, necessary for ordering the island. So order in Ceylon was conflated in their minds with the annexation of Kandy. But annexation was much easier said than done. From 1795, efforts to absorb Kandy revolved around multiple discourses of protection. The first British governor of Ceylon, Frederick North, began by invoking a very familiar mode of protection, protection by treaty. In early 1802, he pushed the King's councillors to accept a treaty that confirmed disputed Dutch conquests in Kandy and granted British monopoly over the cinnamon trade. North's treaty also stipulated that the, king, the Kandian king would not converse with foreigners, would not allow Europeans or Malays to enter Kandy without a governor's passport, and would sponsor, a host of, would sponsor and host a British force in Kandian territory for the better fulfilment, in his words, of the British, British Majesty's engagement to protect the person and authority of the King of Kandy. Kandy and councillors refused to accede to most of these points, but undeterred, North only expanded his demands. By the end of 1802, he was also pushing the King to give Britain power to wield direct influence in his councils. <clears throat> Meanwhile, councillors chafing under the rule of the King of Kandy invoked protection too, but in different ways. When the first Adagar, the chief minister, met with North in 1800 and 1802, he hinted broadly that he wanted to help overthrow the king. In the mid 1700s, the ruling dynasty of Kandy had run out of local heirs and had to import um, monarchs of appropriate caste from mainland India. In the generations that followed, the foreign kings of Kandy settled in, bringing mainland advisors and displacing Sinhalese elites. So in 1800 and 1802, the first Adiga told North that the king displayed his unfitness for rule by persistently affronting local customs, arbitrarily confiscating property, destroying valuable trees, and slaughtering animals outside the Buddhist temple. He sought British protection, essentially against foreign rule. North balked at supporting the Adiga's plans for a coup, but he did begin casting around for rationales for conquest. And when Kandians confiscated some nuts from two native subjects, Britain, trading in Kandy later that year, North mobilised a third mode of protection to muscle in, his obligation to protect British subjects living under his jurisdiction. <clears throat> it did not matter to North that the first Adagar had probably ordered the confiscation specifically in order to provoke a war of conquest by Britain. <clears throat> North first dispatched a commissioner to inquire whether any law or circumstance might excuse this confiscation. He then threatened military action if the king did not pay up. North later expanded his demands to include compensation and submission to his original treaty of protection. It seems that the King of Kandy prevaricated just long enough to give North an excuse to invade. He did not succeed in deposing the king, however. In a move he repeated to lesser effect years later, the king simply abandoned the capital of Kandy as British forces advanced. After being detained into the rainy season and falling ill in droves, British troops were routed by Kandy and detachments in June. They, left slaughter they slaughtered the sick men left behind and forced one retreating company to surrender. Ten years later, two British officers still languished in Kandy in custody. In doing so, Kandy secured its place in the dark dreams of a succession of governors. North's successors, Governors Maitland and Brownrigg, both shared his unhealthy fixation on the kingdom. Brownrigg, who became governor in 1813, went so far as to send a spy called De Uli into the territory to stir up trouble. His spy teamed up with a new, also treasonous, first Adagar to revisit claims of misgovernance first aired a decade earlier. <clears throat> 
in a letter to the governor that really catalogued great wrongs and injustices, as he called them, committed by the king, and the need for some external power to protect, protect Candians from his tyranny. By early 1814, Doyle was openly coaching Candian elites to ask for British protection, warning that the British government would not come to the people's aid unless, and I quote, it saw distinct and unequivocal proof of the general wishes of the Candian people to take refuge under the protection of the British government. One year later, Brownrigg was convinced that the offer of protection provided ample cover for war. He signed a proclamation in 1815 announcing the invasion of Candian territory. The proclamation supplied two main justifications for aggression, a series of very minor border incursions and a duty to aid Candians who had implored, and here I quote again, the protection of the British government from the tyranny and oppression of their ruler. In an important slippage, Brownwood would offer to every individual of the Candian nation the benign protection of the British government. In its late, last paragraph, the proclamation spelled, spelled out what this would mean. The British pledged to retain the ranks and dignities of the chiefs, not to attack the people's religion and to preserve their ancient laws and institutions. <clears throat> At least that's what the proclamation said. It represented these actions as consistent with the extension of the blessings resulting from the establishment of justice, security and peace under the safeguard of the British Crown. <clears throat> these were messy promises indeed. Now protection was being offered to the inhabitants of Candy as a condition of their submission to British troops and not just against the Tyranids king. And it was also being offered against foreign and domestic enemies. In a subtle move, Brownrigg coached his troops to tell the Sinhalese that their emancipation from a foreign-born king was the leading object of war. In contrast, they were told to promise Malabars and Moors, the people who had been imported from the mainland, <clears throat> safe passage back to South India. They were to remind these people that they were in fact natural subjects of the Britannic Majesty. If they opposed British force, they would be labelled not only as enemies, but as traitors. Any other classes of people encountered by British forces might be extended the general offer of protection and invited to place themselves, again individually, under the British standard. <clears throat> so protection turned out to be a much simpler form of imperium than was promised in the first proclamation. After defeating the Candian king, de Oily prepared and translated a document for presentation at a meeting in March with Candian notables. This was Messier again. The public instrument of treaty was read in English and Sinhalese, followed by the raising of the British flag and a cannon salute, marking what they described later as the establishment of British dominion in the interior. The report of the convention rehearsed the spectrum of British protections. <clears throat> The king had forfeited the right to rule by committing atrocities, obstinately refusing to establish peace with the colony and pursuing a policy of general opposition. But invasion rhetoric also shifted to include a critique of Candian law in this iteration. The first section of the treaty explained that the illegitimacy of the Candian government flowed from actions devoid of justice and lay in the arbitrary and unjust inflection of bodily tortures the pains of death without trial, sometimes without accusation, or the possibility of crime, and I'm quoting here, and in, in the general contempt and contravention of all civil rights. This statement prefaced a plan for Candian law reform, so much for respecting their laws, <clears throat> and the transformation of a conquered candy into what was going to be a governable colony or something like it, with plural legal system. <coughs> Pardon me. Doily outlined a plural legal order for Candy that combined a selected exercise of martial law with regard to some classes of people and some crimes, executive control of civil and criminal justice, according to the established forms, the sole discretion of the British governor over capital punishment, and a general prohibition about torture against torture. One day later, the colonial government added a further qualification which exempted non-Candians and British military personnel from any sort of local court. Most importantly, under this settlement, Candy became a site of untravelled executive rule, 
exempted from the supervision of the island's Supreme Court. <clears throat> Brownrigg defended this settlement, <coughs> pardon me everybody, defended this settlement against criticism by arguing that a very considerable period must elapse before His Majesty's new territory will safely admit the exercise of any political or civil, any political, civil or juridical authority which does not in a direct and ostensible manner emanate from the executive government. <coughs> now, you can all tell that it's been a long time since I've given a talk of more than 10 minutes. <clears throat> he noted further that because this convention was an international treaty between sovereigns, judges, British judges working on the periphery had no power to intervene. He explained a political no negotiation between two states according to my idea of it, may indeed be weak, improvident and unwise, and may be corrupt, immoral or even barbarous, but it cannot, in consistency with any received ideas, be called illegal. <clears throat> so, what the most important and interesting gambit here was to create candy as a place of exclusive executive authority. Peace did not last long. Local notables thought they had signed up for a protection of an older kind, a few concessions to the British in return for the installation of a new king of their choosing. They had never imagined the dissolution of their kingdom, the imposition of crown rule and the overlay of a new legal system. So key among them joined a doomed rebellion against the British in 1817, and another rebellion erupted in the 1840s. <clears throat> So this, in, in this delicious case, really, imperial, imperial ambition churned through modes of protection, not just to justify and to sell, I think, but also to think through the conquest and importation of candy, incorporation of candy, in order to facilitate the orderly governance of the island of Ceylon. Their profligacy is familiar. Similar overlays of treaty violence, individual protection and cultural tutelage coalesced into imperial and the international governance at the, end of the, at the end of the 19th century. In one respect, this case suggests how messy local circumstances provided a repertoire for late 19th century international law. At another, it reminds us of the porosity of legal ideas, protection of subjects, vulnerable foreigners, foreign rulers, and lesser states are imperatives that slip seamlessly across jurisdictional boundaries from within the imperatives of ruling a colony over into the imperatives of incorporating a foreign state. In Candy, they were not only pro profligately used, they were also mired in debates about order, disorder and law on the island's colonial perimeter. <clears throat> now let's move to my second example. the plantations in Sumatra. Britain was actually in control of, a, of Dutch holdings in the Spice Islands between the conquest of Java in 1811 and the return to the Dutch in 1824. So, on June 1814, John Canning arrived on the west coast of Sumatra in search for sovereigns. Canning was no lawyer. He was a captain in the Murshidabad Provincial Battalion who had somehow managed to impress the Supreme Government of the East India Company during a failed diplomatic expedition to Burma five years earlier. <clears throat> Resolving the small matter of sovereignty in the Spice Islands was not the preserve of legal experts in the 19th century British Empire, at least in 1814. Canning was deployed to Sumatra first and foremost to seek compensation from the Sultan of Aceh. The Sultan had seized a company sponsored trading ship in early 1813 for breaching his blockade of West Sumatran pepperports. He claimed sovereignty over most of Sumatra's coastline and had blockaded Western ports in an attempt to force recalcitrant plantations to pay him taxes. The Penang government, an offshoot of the East India Company, particularly alarmed by the incident. It chiefly traded in beetle nuts 
with settlements on the east, in eastern Arche and was dismayed by the Sultan's recent efforts to monopolise that trade, and even more so by his efforts to woo other European powers, Napoleon and the Russian Tsar among them, to support his waxing ambitions at home. Without consulting the Supreme Government in Bengal, Penang responded to the seizure of the Anapurpi by sending a naval expedition to Sumatra to forcibly recover the ship and free its officers. The Supreme Government in Calcutta strongly disapproved of this move. For decades, it had been under pressure from the British government for its warmongering on the Indian subcontinent. With its monopoly under pressure, it was eager to please. Routines of diplomacy were far more popular at home than territorial expansion and war, at least where the East India Company was concerned. The Supreme Government had been inclined to respect the Sultan's claims to Western Sumatra. But the capture of the Annapurni marked a new and ominous development in his mode of rule. Calcutta instructed Canning to respond with law, not war. He was sent to do nothing less than to define the legal parameters of the Archonese state. Canning's instructions noted that, of course, he needed to undertake an investigation of the real limits of the king's dominion on the west coast of Sumatra. If the Sultan had no sovereignty over the pepper ports, then seizing the Annapurni was an unjustifiable act of aggression and disappointed investors, East India Company officials among them, would demand compensation for their loss. The basis of the Sultan's claims to the region were very old and very new. The Sultan claimed title to the West Coast by virtue of centuries old dispensation. However, the region had since become the subject of another claim. Settlers from the Malay Peninsula had long taken up residence in the region. More recently, a new wave of Archinese settlers arrived bearing a new variety of pepper plants that thrived there. In the 1790s, when Americans first came to trade, these plantations produced 2.13 million pounds of pepper. In 1822, they produced 18.6 million pounds. It was clearly a thriving trade. So it's small wonder that the Sultanate of Arche wanted to exercise more power, particularly over Archinese emigres involved in the pepper trade. From the late 18th century, a succession of Sultans decreed that all trade should be channeled through Banda Arche something like the 17th century navigation acts. But they lacked a strong navy to enforce this rule. The Sultan Jahur al-Alam, who ruled Aceh from 1795 to 1815, and then again from 1819 to 1823, was the first to seriously attempt to enforce these new rules. He not only sought arms from foreign rulers, in pepper trading season, he took to heading a small fleet to Western ports to man a blockade. So when his blockade captured the Annapurni and towed it back to Banda Arche, Yalha did something new and troubling. He acted on claims to sovereignty, new claims to sovereignty that would have a direct bearing on company profits. The riddle of the Sultan's authority clearly captured Canning's imagination to the detriment of his mission. To the mortification of the Sultan, Canning ignored him entirely Instead of negotiating for compensation, he toured the pepper plantations for six months, finding sovereigns everywhere he went. His 1,000 page report weighed every claim for the Sultan's authority. The Sultan's claim to land title, he said, was void. It had dubious documentary support. The original deed, if indeed that's the appropriate term for the document, was lost. His claims to dominion, moreover, had been made redundant by the long residence of Malay settlers who had set up self-governing states in the region. Archinese newcomers, Canning argued, were either guests or became subjects of these new states, even when they insinuated themselves into positions of power therein. Even if they were subjects of the Sultan, Archinese bodies did not carry the Sultan's authority to Western Sumatra. There they lived on foreign soil under foreign territorial sovereignty. <clears throat> Canning even came up with his own definition of sovereignty. I mean, it doesn't sound too wrong, but it definitely wasn't taken out of a treatise. In his words, the principal and most prominent essentials to the sovereign prerogative I take to be the possession of civil, military and criminal jurisdiction, the right and power of appointing representative in the person of the governor and the right of collecting revenue. Where these privileges and immunities really exist, 
cannot be doubted that such country or district is under the power and authority of whomever possesses them. Whereas the want or absence of them seems to me to necessarily imply the reverse. The Sultan, in Canning's view, held none of these powers in Western Sumatra, even over Archinese subjects. Where he had tried to introduce government representatives, they had been spurned. Taxes, even when claimed, had uniformly been unpaid. He did not hear appeals from any local cases. Regional demagogues, not the Sultan, heard complaints about the dispensation of justice in the region. <clears throat> Many residents of Western Sumatra welcomed Canning's certification of their independence. If they were independent of the Sultan, they didn't have to pay him taxes. A number of plantations had already appealed to the British outpost at Bengulu to protect them against the Sultan's growing ambitions to interfere in trade. The leader of Sinkil, an aristocrat and former office holder in Arche, who himself acted as a kind of strong man in the region, had openly waged war against the Sultan he had recently captured the Archinese capital, in fact, and stole some of the Sultan's armour. Needless to say, he outright refused to acknowledge the Sultan's sovereignty. However, in Canning's rendering, even the Sultan's avowed subjects might be sovereigns in disguise. He found professions of loyalty from the chiefs of Tahus to be, what he said, of strange and extraordinary nature, as the chiefs look upon the place entirely as an inheritance of their own, in his words and have never paid the Sultan any duties, nor had the Sultan tried to collect them. These, he said, were not real bonds of allegiance, they were imagined. Canning was so busy finding sovereigns that he failed in his negotiations with the Sultan. Indeed, having accurately surmised that Canning had been seducing my subjects from their allegiance, the Sultan formally refused him an audience at the capital. <clears throat> the outcome? Canning's enormously long report, transcribed by some poor soul in duplicate, declared that the Annapurni was not in Archinese waters when it was captured. He recommended that, that the Sultan's fleet be destroyed to protect free trade. Though his findings about sovereignty were welcome at the time, his bellicosity was much less, less so. The company did not move against the Sultan. They didn't need to in any case. Canning's machinations helped to precipitate a rebellion among the elite in Arche. From 1814 to 1819, the Sultanate was racked by civil war as a result. <clears throat> but in the context of rising sea raiding in the region, this protracted affair produced a different sort of sovereignty talk from other company pundits. As Stanford Raffles put it to the Supreme Government, nothing can so tend, can tend so effectually to the suppression of piracy to the encouragement and extension of lawful commerce and to the civilization of the inhabitants of the Eastern Islands as affording a steady support to the established native sovereigns and assisting them in the maintenance of their just rights and authority over the several chiefs and along the shores dependent on their dominions. In short, a functional arche was key to Raffles plan. And indeed from 1819, the British helped to end the war in arche and were even happy for the Sultan to extend his territorial control. But by the same token, Canning had been right to some degree. As you can see from this map from 1827, the pepper ports continued to refuse to pay taxes and to operate more or less as separate states. The self-serving ends of Canning's project and the fickleness of East India Company policy are much less interesting to me than the discourses and practices of sovereignty here. This moment is fascinating because of its porosity. The Sultan of Arche was himself trying to transform his state with Western trade money by changing old claims and weak allegiances into new, more legible claims to sovereignty. He was trying to govern and tax with demands, with officials, and finally with warships. Canning was sent out to determine whether or not the Sultan could do this. Sending a soldier to puzzle out the political boundaries of an island is a very early 19th century British thing to do. Law talk was so quotidian, so ubiquitous that a military officer was assumed to know how to identify sovereignty and thus to interpret and remake a local interpolity order. He did not quote a textbook, he conjured sovereignty from experience. His conceit is mesmerizing. So is the project. Note that he was not sent to force the Sultan to desist from tax collecting, rather he was sent to conduct a sort of legal anthropology 
in order to ground a case to the company and to the Sultan <clears throat> about the limits of his authority. Canning was not dispatched to find colonies or even political dependents for the East India Company or the British Empire. The company had repeatedly spurned calls from rebel pepper plantations for British protection. His search for sovereigns tapped into a different reservoir of legal strategies that were just as important to the British Empire in the early 19th century, managing transaction costs by helping to conjure states and to adjudicate their regional relationships. Ultimately, Canning veered off course. His actions precipitated a crisis that for the company was much more dangerous than the transaction costs associated with paying tax. Other pundits, Raffles Key among them, also thought sovereigns were key to fragile regional orders, but he picked one sultan over myriad tiny states. The point is that sovereignty talk was everywhere and imperial actors acted as midwives to independent interpolity orders, more or less in the interests of empire. And the conversations about sovereignty were consequential. They unfolded with complex local politics, with the ambitions of sovereigns on the make, to conjure and dissolve regional orders. So here are just two rich examples of the ways in which messy imperial ambitions spilled over into the sphere of interpolity law on the edges of the early 19th century British Empire. Let me spend just a few minutes explaining why Laurie and I thought small stories like this had something to say about the history of international law. Some of you might be wondering. First, they move us beyond important, but also limited conversations focused on lawyers and jurists. As international law became a distinctive field in the second half of the 19th century, we know that jurists found built rules about membership that left out certain states predicated on standards of civilization. Non-Western societies were cast as outsiders who may one day have the potential to join the international legal community as full members. We also know how the universalizing tendencies of 19th century and international law carried justifications for the assertion of imperial power over colonies and client states. This is all very important, but it only gets us so far. Our goal in Rage for Order was to move focus from a history of European ideas towards an examination of their articulation in practice. In doing so, we also want to move beyond the or beyond important, very important histories of colonial lawyer jurists like, say, Grotius or Twiss, towards much more quotidian actors pursuing much more quotidian goals. We argue that the rapidly evolving British imperial constitution stood at the intersection of domestic and international law. Further, we drew attention to the way that legal influences flowed from the outside, from the inside out, from scattered legal conflicts and debates within the empire to regional and global legal patterns. The claim works with and not against intellectual histories. It redefines intellectual influ influences as much more diffuse, distributed across empire in the writings, utterances, and acts of participants in imperial legal conflicts, from middling officials to the most vulnerable subjects. Here I focused on two particular episodes, one in Ceylon, where the desire of successive governors to order the new island colonies spilled over into a very creative attempt to use multiple balances of protection to incorporate the Kingdom of Candy. And also to subject it to executive rule. The second resulted from British efforts to manage trade by tinkering with dynamic politics the, the dynamic politics of a regional order in Arche. Their efforts resulted in an unstable regional legal regime made up of fragmented polities, sustained in part by inter-imperial arrangements and shaped by the efforts of the British Empire to exercise some influence. Such constellations created a framework, however unstable or short-lived, for legal relations between empires and emergent states. In general, our approach suggests that international law is less a corpus of doctrines than it is a diffuse, a set of diffuse phenomena. Uh, then, sorry, then it is comprised of such diffuse phenomena as non-governmental networks and administrative procedures, 
And the examples I've given here, but even more so perhaps in British campaigns against slave traders and pirates, British officials and jurors sometimes refer to natural law principles, but they more often acted on the basis of combination of municipal law, treaties, vaguely defined and often aspirational customary usage, and assertions about a British right to intervene that itself derived largely from imperial context even or especially where the British could not pretend to have political dominance and could assert only limited jurisdiction. <coughs> I mean, British agents sought to mould regional systems in which multiple polities, whether other empires or microstates, would assist in enforcing British supported norms. This was a messy endeavour, a disorderly rage for order, and it often went very wrong. The point is to shift historical view not just by putting doctrines in context in order to demonstrate their grubby origins or their cynical use for imperial ends. The point is to move towards a history of interpolity law, focused on patterns and processes of ordering that spill over boundaries and reconfigure ideas about matters as fundamental, but also as ill-defined as authority, statehood and protection with unpredictable consequences. Thank you. <clears throat> and I'm so sorry about all the coughing. I think the spring finally caught up to me here in Australia. I'm sitting just next to a window with a very flowery garden outside. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk, uh, <clears throat> Professor Ford. Um, we are open to questions. Uh, so, um, yeah. So okay, if you have I'll questions. I'll try to turn off my screen. Um, I have a few questions, but I would like to field questions from the audience first. So, of the 20 odd participants we have, 21 actually, um, do we have questions? Okay, so let me start. So, let, let me ask a question because uh, maybe our audience will take some time to craft a question. So, my first question is uh, as I said, you know, informally when, when you're talking informally, that uh, there is some dissatisfaction, uh, uh, you know, with, with the way the history of international law is done by Europeans, you know, essentially biographical, you know, reading, you know, uh, you know 19th century thinkers, uh, lawyers of inter in law, international law is coming down to lot, all the way to lot of facts. So there's a way in which they do biographical work. And your work fundamentally sort of um, challenges that view of legal history or history of international law to say that the history of international law itself is a is an oxymoron because what you find is interpolity law um, and it's by actually um, focusing on as you call micro nations uh, island nations that you actually see the real process of the universalization of international law so you'd like to hear a bit about uh, uh, that um, uh, well, I mean, we've been thinking about this quite a lot, partly because there has been some pushback among um, particularly international lawyers um, interested in history against that approach. Um, you might have seen a recent piece, Andrew Fitzmorris. Well, he's actually an intellectual historian, published critiquing Laurie's work quite pointedly. <clears throat> and I think I think actually, if we're not trying to um, undermine the validity or challenge the value of that kind of work. But I think that I actually disagree fundamentally with Andrew's piece. I think he honestly could have read the book a bit closer. But I think there's a grain of something there. I think that the best work, and I think the best work that Laurie's done, and I haven't done as much of this work, I'm much more of an imperious empiricist than she is really, is going to bring those two worlds together, right? I, and I think I, Jennifer's work gets really close to this in some of its iterations, is to really take the ideas extremely seriously and tease out those moments of separation. So we've focused in on these people out in the middle of nowhere, often doing incredibly ignorant things, but they're consequential things, right? So we can't ignore them. We can't ignore them because of the way the British Empire works. So these people do these crazy things. 
everybody hears about them, a big debate ensues, and often it's, it's resolved at the interface of legal opinion and politics, right? And it's, it, it's, it's ridiculous to ignore that sort of mess. But there's a whole body of work, I think, to be done figuring out how much those people actually knew, taking a bit more seriously their own intellectual trajectory as their education. But we haven't done that work in nature order, finding out exactly who these people are. And we did it sometime. But I think that there is actually a whole body of work that would be somewhere in between those two positions. And that would be really, really valuable and interesting and important. So my, so, so my next question comes from your answer. So <laughs> now, uh, I, as I see, uh, for a legal historian, um, uh, you created three, uh, three uh, constituencies of, uh, uh, of uh, or three constituencies in which the history of international law mm -hmm. is being received differently. So there are Australians, uh, you know, Australians, so let's say legal historians in Australia, and then you have Europeans doing um, their Kant, you know, Hegel onwards kind of sort of intellectual history. And then us, mm -hmm. us post-colonials uh, colonials who have had a lived experience of a kind, but you know, we've had independence since 47 in India's case. So the reception is very different. So I, I my, you know, if I may put my own views uh, mm. as a form of a question, the European project is very intellectually dissatisfying in that sense, uh, because to, you know, uh, time and again, sort of put the history of international as the history of uh, white, think, white men thinkers telling, instructing the world is, ontologically uh, wrong, right? I have I've had the benefit of reading uh, Fitz Morris's work in details. And in fact, I had the privilege of comparing your, uh, you know, your co, co, you know, your work, your and uh, Lauren Benton's work with Fitz Morris's work, precisely on that point. So I think uh, the reception is, the reception of what you're saying actually should also have some value because there is a problem in that his European project of completely, you know, uh, uh, disrobing or completely ignoring the agency of the governed, right? Um, and therefore, it paints uh, a picture that is basically inaccurate. The fact that there is no agency of, uh, you know, uh, those who will govern, which you bring out very beautifully, because in your work, we see that the sailors, the convicts, the governors, uh, the local politicians, the local elites, they've all, uh, they have agencies of various degree. And that's how I think history should be done. And if that is how we do history, then of course that is going to impact the way we do the history of law and therefore the history of international law. Now I would like uh, Carl to uh, ask a few questions. It would be nice mm -hmm. to get some direction. Sure. Uh, no, I thought, I thought this, uh, this, the, uh, Overall project and uh, the talk are fantastic. It's very, very, very important. The messiness of it all is if anybody can't uh, recognize that that has to be the case, uh, there, um, uh, that's a form of uh, you know, blindness. Uh, it has to be messy. It can't be uh, otherwise. Uh, there's an, uh, when I was working on the Nigerian lawyer um, Elias, I came across a Daiki's book on uh, trade and politics in the Niger Delta. At least I don't know the extent to which you know that about different layers of of the of um, the colonial uh, incursion into the Niger Delta, were in you know in, you know fighting with each other. Very much the stuff of your book and and, and Lauren's book. Mm -hmm. um, it can't but be very messy. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it's, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of intellectual history as my, you know, in, in, uh, but you have to recognize that things are very complicated. There are all these different parts of it. There's no clean picture. There are lots of different, there are always different, uh, um, different uh, groups, uh, different constituencies, uh, and layering of different cultures, different economies. The, the world is not, you know, the world is complicated and it gets complicated the more you look with a microscope at each piece. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the fact that you brought such attention to these conflicts, to the messiness is, is just fantastic and uh, very important. Uh, and so then the question is where you go from, you know, exactly how you get from the messiness to, uh, you know, any sort of 
narrative, uh, that gets more complicated. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know that uh, I just wanted to re to recognize that as as so essential, and and that book was needed to be written. Thank you. Um, wow, that's it. Well, and I think that is it. It was it. Chris Tomlin's a few years ago was taking issue with history becoming the basically the art of it's more complicated. And that critique has sat with me a little bit because in some respects, I've just embraced that. I think the value of it in a sort of a meta sense in some ways is to, and this goes to the whole problem of doing international law or being a lawyer. I did a law degree like a million years ago. It's an undergraduate thing in Australia. So I was like, you know, 20. Um, and I don't remember much of it, obviously. But the neatness of things, the, the difference between how lawyers think, and we're just going to our conversation before, Brooke, the, you know, the, the, the neatness of law and laws need to put everything in neat categories with precedents, etc. Does such, it doesn't translate well. And I guess intellectual history sometimes does that too, because you know, being so close to philosophy and its modes, it wants an oeuvre, it wants things to be internally consistent, wants them to make sense. And people have been chipping at the edges of it, even in histor histories you wouldn't necessarily approve of, you know, like figuring out what, what work Grotius was doing in the East Indies, right? That's an interesting and important story. And it's still working within somebody's ideas, right? And reaching outside them occasionally. But the sort of meta thing that I find attractive is the notion that these people didn't know what they were doing. Empire was always a mess. These states were grossly informed. To anyone who knows anything about say, South Asian history can see that it was just grossly incompetent, right? And incompetent that told in the lives of millions of people. That sort of working from that in, I think, tells you much more about how states actually work you know, in a, in a, in a larger trans-historical sense. Um, but also, it, it's a much more instructive way to understand why empire wreaked such havoc across the world. Um, and I'm attracted to that story of incompetence and, and contingency and making it up as they went along. I find that endlessly fascinating, but also tragic at the same time. And yes, you did that with, difficult. and you did Sorry, that without ahead. using the word bricolage. <laughs> yeah, it's not really part of my, um, you know, vocabulary. But I'm going to use that in the next, in the next little <laughs> while. It, it lends itself very well to what the commissioners were doing. Now, commissions project is just hilarious in terms to, in terms of what ignorant people going out trying to make sense of the world do and say. <laughs> They're really, really, really very funny, but also in a consequential and not very good way. So, so again, to sort of align uh, the, the, the remarks and question by Carl with what you just said, I do understand, or we uh, in, in, in South Asia do understand the way uh, international legal history is being done post Marty Koskinimi's work on sort of folk, you know, intellectual histories, okay? That is all right when it is done, you know, 20 years ago by Koskinimi. Uh, in fact, Carl's work, although, as he said, is intellectual history, uh, it is ahead of that European work because Carl has been focusing not on usual suspects, the Americans, sort of, the, the, the Europeans sort of talking about international and creating international by writing books, but he has been focusing on non-Western scholars who are receiving it like we are receiving it today and then reflecting. So that way, in fact, there is this Marty Koskinimi driven intellectual histories of international law. Then there is Carl right in between who's actually, you know, sort of uh, telling us, well, intellectual histories are okay so long as you also look at non-Western scholars and minds because they were, they had some agency, which Carl has done. And then of course, everything is revolutionized post your book, at least for me, when you're saying, well, not just the elites of, uh, of, of the global South, but also the non-elites, uh, you know, convicts and sailors and, petty politicians and high bureaucrats and governors, all of them actually participating because the order is messy, there's no order. So unfortunately, the intellectual history project then becomes a very Hegelian project. And we must not forget that this is precisely what Alexander Witch, the great Alexander Witch, who 
came from Poland to India, teaching in Madras in South India, mm -hmm. was challenging. He basically, and in fact, he was so dissatisfied with 19th century and things. You know, his book says, his book studies 16th, 17th and 18th century because he thinks that after that it becomes very, uh, very um, Hegelian in the sense that it becomes sovereignty driven. And that the shadow of that Hegelian project, I think, falls on to the European intellectual history project, which, as I say, is intellectually dissatisfying, at least in the 21st century, for, for uh, us in India and other ex-colonies. Uh, so that's just a comment. So then my question to, again, to uh, Professor Ford mm -hmm. is, so you, would you say that then, uh, at the end of the day, a real history is archival history? Um, yes. Yes, I mean, I used to actually, you know, don't, you know, of course you'll repeat this, but I used to, I once teased David Armitage that I loved the sort of history he did because it could all just be on his bookshelf. Um, but no, look, I think it depends on your goals, right? And I think there is a, there is a place for a history of books and ideas. Um, and I know he did that, you know, there was a moment when I was doing that sort of work as an undergrad thinking, I like this finding things that work. I like looking for wholeness. I like looking for, you know, influence in following texts and, and texts matter, books matter, right? I mean, again, that's why that next step of looking at where all these ne'er-do-wells got their ideas from on the edges of empire is actually interesting and important work in some ways. Um, <clears throat> So I'm hedging, aren't I? I don't know. You know what? I just think I like to do it that way. I'm, um, and I do think the sort of history that we do, the history of empires, I think is, is better done with your sleeves rolled up in the archive. Because ultimately, and with all respect to um, Jennifer, ultimately, I mean, Edmund Burke is a fascinating and important political actor. But the ramifications of what he said and did are just shadows of what actually happened and why it happened. Um, and making sense of that from the centre is enormously important in terms of British politics. And that's the other challenge we're facing at the moment, right? Steve Pinks is on a rampage about the fact that we don't do enough British politics anymore. And that's so true because for so many years, I think about reading some of these dreary books about, you know, <clears throat> liberal Toryism and whatever, and never did. We do need to understand those interfaces too. And that's a history of printed parliamentary schedules, which are archives, I guess, but it's also a history of books. It all has a place, right? But I don't think anything can be done in isolation. And I think we all need to be doing more of that layered work from the, the treatises down. I think I need to do more of the treatise work. It's been a long time since I've read a lot of broad treatises. Okay, uh, do we have uh, questions from other participants now? Please, it would be nice to have questions from you. Um, if not, then maybe Ajita or Carl could ask another question. We have uh, two minutes left. Yes, no, I did want to respond uh, on, on the intellectual history because intellectual history itself can be extremely messy. Uh, people's thoughts are complicated. So to think that there's, there is, you know, this uh, figure like Grotius or this figure like Twiss uh, and that person's thought fits in a little uh, box and isn't complicated by all sorts of pieces, all the pieces that you talk about but all the weird uh, uh, digressions, co conflicts within their own work, changes. Uh, you, you mentioned influence. Um, anybody who has influence, the interesting thing is not who influences them, but why they appropriate this earlier mm. source. What are they doing with it? Why? Uh, what's going on? So, when you get into intellectual history, of course, it has to bring in cultural history, yeah. political history, all the stuff <clears> that's <throat> brought out by others from the archives, et cetera. It's messy. So intellectual history can be this clean, neat thing, but it shouldn't be. 
No, I'm sorry. I was being grossly oversimplifying there. And I think you're right. And I think it gets really interesting in that sort of work that, that you've been doing. And I've got a colleague here who's been doing some very uncomfortable work looking at Indigenous activists and how they've absorbed idea and ideas and how they're reflecting them back as political activism in the 1920s. It's a really fraught political endeavour um, because the way that people, they, these people both embrace progress and also trouble it. Um, yeah, it doesn't sit well with a lot of uh, people in Australia who really want a properly post-colonial and decolonizing narrative, particularly when indigenous people speak. Um, so I, you know, that work is so important and it's so important to do it carefully and to you know, take seriously people's what influences they have and their political aspirations and contexts as well. So absolutely. Absolutely. All right, with that answer, you've come to the end of our uh, session. It was a pleasure to have Professor Ford talk to us. And hopefully this is uh, just the start of um, a larger conversation uh, between lawyers and historians to understand, as you say, this messy thing uh, with uh, more neatness, if I may. Uh, put it that way. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for inviting me. And again, I'm sorry for coughing so much while I was talking to you. I'll try and sneak along to some more of your meetings in the next few weeks. You're welcome to attend uh, them. Please, please do. Yeah. Lovely to meet you all. Same here. Take care. Bye.